Hey everybody, welcome to GT Live. My name is Brandon Jones. I'm joined by Mr. Ben Moore. Hello. We got Mr. Daniel Bloodworth over here. Hey, hey. Mr. Matt Blair. Hi, everybody. And over on the couch, Mr. Kyle Bossman. Hey, everybody. And I know what you're doing. <laughs> I know what you're doing. You're already searching the stage. You're like, wait, who's the get? Wait, Matt, you're not special guest. Wait, what's happening right now? Well, I'm it's not the special. Week. It's the week. You, you are special. You're not a special guest. Oh. You can be in that chair and be a guest and be special. Not technically a special guest because typically on GT Live we have um, we have three things: we have a game, a giveaway, and a special guest. We have none of those <laughs> because it's the week following E3. Uh, we are still just kind of blindsided by this crazy show. Still uh, going through all of our stuff, so it seemed kind of weird to you know to bring in a guest to this week and um, be like, hey, what do you want to talk about? Who would even, even have us? Uh, um, we, we got some. We, I got some people lined up for some future episodes of, of GT Live, but it made sense to just to finalize our our E three coverage. Uh, we're going to kick things off a little bit early this week for those of you uh, who are just tuning in now uh, with uh, three just plays to wrap up. I think our E three just played catalog, right? Uh, and then just talk about. Uh, either games that are not big enough for Just Played or games that we've already talked about in some capacity and then another person got their hands on it at the show and we kind of want to, um, you know, finalize that conversation. Um, so any, anything else you want to address? But we can jump right into these Just Plays. Yeah, I mean, I call this munching on the E3 leftovers. Um, it's so good, though. Yeah, they're, they're, they're tasty. And Ben got to see a lot of them. That's why he's up here. <laughs> like so many things like, Ben, we can't shoot all this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, we keep saying final this, final that for E3, and it just never ends up being final. Uh, maybe the, the awards will be the last thing. Uh, and speaking of, the awards uh, will be this weekend. Uh, I believe we settled on eight categories in total for our E3 awards. Um, so a little bit smaller than some of the offerings that we've done before, um, but uh, it didn't make it any easier for us to uh, uh, pick those. We definitely you know, uh, got in a spitting match. Uh, over what was the best. No, because there's lots of really good things at E3, but obviously, you know, you got to decide what our favorite thing was. So you can uh, look forward to that this weekend. Obviously, no countdown this week because we're going to be doing our E3 awards. So let's get into it. Uh, do we, we want to go in order? This is our Yeah, we're going in order. order. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so for those of you at home, we, the, these are going to be uh, episodes of Just Play that we're actually going to cut out. So if they seem to have a, a formulated beginning and ending, that is why. We realize we are live, but we are also going to be clipping these out. So... Uh, let's go really before we do that. Let's go to the control room. We got a very busy control room over there. We got Ian and uh, Don and Brad looming over him. Hi. Hey. Hi. They're Hello. they're supervising me to make sure I don't make mistakes. Right. No. <laughs> Thank goodness. I have to say I, f I feel bad for Kyle. He looks lonely over there on that couch. Well, Brad was playing with him with the dinosaur for quite a while before the show started. So you know. What did you just say? That they were playing with the dinosaur for a while before the show it's started. It's not a euphemism, <laughs> literally. Oh, yeah. there's an actual dinosaur yeah. that they were playing with. Okay. Kyle's, Kyle's got the whole chat over there. I got the whole chat. I'm uh, most comfortable when I'm lonely. Whoa. Wow. Okay. <laughs> this got dark. Save that one for a second. Okay, yeah, all right. Not, not here, not the place. I can't think of a better transition into a just play than that. <laughs> Let's do it. Are you ready, Ian? Yes. Are you ready, Table? Are you recording? All right. Yes. So Fallout was a huge, I don't know if you can call it announcement because we knew that it was going to happen before the show, um, but had a huge presence at the show. And I'm, I'm really into this concept of making a smaller free mobile game associated with your game or your franchise and then releasing that during E3 because E3, you know, uh, we're very lucky, Ben, uh, and because we get to go to appointments. Mm -hmm. We go somewhere and we say, hello, my name is Ben. And they say, oh, Ben, we're expecting you. Please come over here. Maybe wait for five, ten minutes, maybe 15 minutes max, yep. and then play this game. And then go on your way and tell other people about it. But a lot of the people that go to the show, <laughs> they get their hands on games, wait for uh, in excess of an hour. I think an hour maybe you're lucky for a lot of these, especially at Nintendo. Uh, those lines can go around the corner. And so uh, having a mobile game like Fallout Shelter <laughs> during E3, yeah. uh, a game that will, will, will get and keep you excited about Fallout, and a game that is fairly entertaining in its own right, and a game I appreciate, of course, on Just Played, because I can play it while we're actually doing the Just Played. <laughs> yeah. So rude. So, uh, yeah, so excuse me, gentlemen, I'm going to play this video game. You, I, so I got it on my phone. You got it on your iPad, yes. Mr. Matt Player. I've oh, actually wow. been attacked by Raiders twice since we started the show. What so do you think it. of Fallout Shelter? I think that the game itself is just... it's. Remarkably simple, and I think that's what makes it really good as a game. But the, the best part about it is that they actually were able to say, you're going to download it in five minutes or now. Like, it's available now. That is, like, one of the greatest things that you can do at E3 specifically. Because there's just so much 
excitement about that where it's just like you have people at home watching because 99% of the people that are watching are not there. Right, so that's something for everybody else to just instantly be like, "Oh crap, really? This is great. This is something new. This is E3. This is super awesome." And I get my hands on it now. Perfect, absolutely perfect. And w like amidst all the other amazing announcements that they did for Fallout, like they they definitely did not have to do this. This came out of absolutely nowhere. They just and you know announcing it in the perfect way, saying, "Well, we play a lot of mobile games too. We we figured, hey, you know what? Why not? Somebody had a good idea, and we were like." Screw it. Yeah, let's make one. Cool, they did. And they here it is. You can yep. play it now. They didn't make a big deal out of it. They didn't ask you to pay for it. They don't ask you for microtransactions. Of course, they're there because that's just kind of a, you know, a thing. It's the business model, yeah. Sure. And you know, they want to be able to make money off of their efforts, sure. But you you never have to pay. See, Unlike many other games out there, that's like it's just the whole package is kind of perfect. I I feel like I've gotten Less impressed with Fallout Shelter as time has gone on. Wait, I, I wouldn't. I would not call it an impressive game. I, I wouldn't <laughs> say it's, it is going for impressiveness. Yeah, but the the way that they talked about it on the show is they were like, we saw what was out there on the market and we wanted to make something that was better than that, that offered more depth and kind kind of, but it's just all you're really doing when you boil the game down to its its like purest thing is you're just sort of watching numbers go up and down. And sure. I mean that <laughs> welcome that's mobile games. Yeah. I mean Right, but like they they could non, have made non -competitive it non competitive mobile games. And I think that's sure. one of the things maybe that's miss uh, that's missing from the game is some kind of competitive element, especially mm -hmm. if you're uh, going to want people to play this at E3. It'd be really great like now that I'm in line, yeah, we can play this game against each other versus like we're all just kind of stuck in our own little Shelters, but Ben, are you just are you just salty right now? Because your your shelters having problems. Well, my shelters are having problems <laughs> because if you sort of like leave it for a day or two, it goes bad really oh. really quickly. Yeah, like I, I can't I can't stay on this thing all the time, you know. Right, and I understand that. That always frustrates me. I think the first time I got into an incident like that was uh, I think Pokemon Silver. Where they had the berries and like you had to keep up with the berries and if not they would just die out on you. Right. <laughs> it it reminds me a lot of of Animal Crossing because anytime no. I go to my Animal Crossing. Kyle's time. trying to correct me here. Fact checking your berries can't die in Pokemon Silver. <laughs> the the but the trees. No, the trees are fine. I remember having tr issues with things dying on me. I don't know where those trees. Issues came from. Whoa! <laughs> My cart's entirely dead Sorry, now. Sorry, fallout shelter. Fallout shelter. <laughs> no, I, I, I love the I love the idea of Kyle just getting mad and telling us we're wrong. Like that's the only time he interjects. Well, it's usually <laughs> it's really about funny. Pokemon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I I like it. Follows the art style uh, that has been established mm -hmm. by the games. I like that we get. Um, you know these little cartoon versions of these characters. I like that I can tell that he's that they're sad because they're sad. They actually have like sad faces walking around. Um, I like that you can put little costumes on them. I like that you can put them anywhere, but obviously you want to put you want to assign them to things that they're good at. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of restrictions that way. Um, but it is tough. I did. I'm on my third vault and my uh, uh, failed my first two miserably. Really? I think by building too fast. I think that's like yeah. the, one of the mm -hmm. big issue that I, I've seen a lot of people have. Um, that. Um, just because you unlock a new building and you can build something doesn't mean you should. You should definitely, you know, um, fill up all three of those meters regularly and then like, oh, okay, now I can move on sure. um, to something because I think it's like, you know, that hurdle that you have to get past. By meters, you mean you have to control how much power, food, and water you have. Correct. Yeah. Those are your three main things. Ben, what do you think about the concept of, because um, you can get a little salty sometimes about microtransactions and, <laughs> and, and pay to win. Uh, what, what do you think about having a free app um, I'm trying to think of like other, you know, would would Final Fantasy 14? Would more people have been talking about that this week if they had announced some fun little companion app like like the uh, World of Warcraft has the auction house, you know, app and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, that it can benefit a publisher to do something like this to have a project that coincides with other things they're talking about during the show? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I I think I think what is the best thing for me and kind of what I one of the biggest things I wish Fallout Shelter had is it's not gonna have any impact on Fallout 4 um, and I think if you are going to call it a, a companion app uh, let it feed into the game in some way I, it, maybe maybe it's impossible but you know you can build your own shelters in Fallout 4 now how cool would it be if you could either earn resources for that shelter in Fallout 4 in Fallout Shelter or you know even if you could somehow maybe replicate what you were building in Fallout 4 that would be incredible um, but 
Yeah, I think I think that like the fundamental problem for me about Fallout Shelter is I just I don't care about any of the people. Like you can kind of zoom in and see their conversations, and it's almost like they're saying non sequiturs to each other. Again, they just sort of feel like a collection of stats. And maybe I'm expecting too much out of this game. It, it is completely free, and uh, it does look really good. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe that didn't answer your question. <laughs> well, but, 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 I mean, from someone like you, I don't think they, I don't think Fallout 4 could be more exciting. I don't think they, you know, they didn't necessarily need to plant more Fallout 4 thoughts into your head throughout the week of E3. You're going to keep talking about it. Whereas uh, someone who's maybe not that familiar with the franchise, but you know, is you know addicted to mobile games and does need something. I don't know. I, I think it's just um, it's. Everybody gets to these press conferences. It's always about okay, what are you going to give me? You know, so you literally right. start these, and it's just like okay, what what news do you have? How excited am I going to be after the show? And and announcements are fun, um, but I I just think there's some kind of special magic about PT about this about putting something in in, in our hands that we can talk about that can keep the conversation going. Absolutely. Not, not that I'm comparing Fall Shelter to PT, but uh, in a way it was directly. in a way it was uh, another moment of depressing realization for me. Uh, you know, we, we were looking at Fallout 4, and it's like, okay, this is what Fallout can be on these new consoles, and, you know, this is why I love video games. And then you're like, here's the Fallout mobile game, and it's just managing numbers. And it's you like, no, this... so defeated and disappointed this, by this what is, we got. This is what mobile gaming is, and right. they, they totally catered to that, to that market and that audience. And I, I realize more and more every day... I don't want to play these games. This is not fun. Is there not like, like any mobile game that you regularly play or you wish this would be more like, do you have an example of something that you would kind of expect from a mobile game that's going to wow you? Sure, maybe it's not a fair example, but uh, Hearthstone, you know, it, okay. has, it has all of the functionality and depth uh, that the, the core PC game has. And obviously you can't get something like Fallout 4 right. on a mobile device, but... Maybe you could even do an isometric fall game in the old style. That would be super cool. Yeah. It's, it's a bummer to me, not only that this is what mobile gaming is, but that so many people fall into that trap. You know, People love just seeing that number go up. It's like, okay, if I collect 100 energy, I get some caps. I can't wait to tap that button and get that thing. But like, that's what life is, Ben. We watch the numbers go up and hope we have fun doing it. That's 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 basically it. It is. Uh, it is. It's just. At least in closing, Ben, you have to admit that uh, it was more exciting for Todd Howard to come out and be like, "Hey, here's this mobile game attached to a franchise that everyone's talking about right now that you didn't know you were getting that is available right now. You can mm -hmm. go get it literally before this press conference is over, and you can be playing it." Versus, like an art trailer for this Elder Scrolls Online card game that we're making, no yeah. gameplay. Yeah. Maybe you'll find out about it a couple months down the road. Also, I, card, card game you can't play things. versus every, Fallout game you can't play. Maybe, maybe, but I feel like every time I play Fallout Shelter, I just end the session feeling nothing. So <laughs> maybe if they didn't announce it, I would feel the same way. Have you played it, and how are you ending this session of talking about <laughs> Fallout Shelter? Uh, I actually haven't got to play it yet. I haven't got to download it. How do you feel about it now, Plaid? Are you, are you, are you excited? Is, um, do you think Ben's making me less excited, it? but I still want to check it out for sure. Because you, you think about Animal Crossing, right? Right. <laughs> okay. And Animal Crossing occasion. is basically just feeding the machine, right? So you got to pay off your house. You're doing all these little mundane tasks to do that. But that's not what makes Animal Crossing special. It's right. that each of these weird little animals, you get to know them better, and they respond to your decisions, and you have these interesting interactions. That's the right way to do this kind of game. You know, it's it's not about the numbers. It's it's the things behind them that I think matter. Yeah, it's interesting. I, at the same time, I think kind of taking personality away from things and kind of like you know popularizing the obvious mundaneness of living in a vault is kind of part of the humor that the Fallout games run on. You know, so it's like you almost like couldn't make that game because of how generic and cookie cutter you know life appears uh, to be in the vault. I don't you know. know, where it's just I, don't like, know I wouldn't call it a creative decision to make it that way, but like I kind of look at where this is coming from and who this is coming from. Mm -hmm. I never felt all that. I mean, let's be honest. The, the character that most people are attached to in the entire franchise for Fallout is a dog. No dialogue. Like, you know, Fallout is a, an end of the world kind of place where everything seems dreary and there's not a lot of room for personality. I disagree. Think about, think about Mr. Handy. Okay, that he you encounter him like immediately in Fallout Three. Okay, and he's this weird little orb robot that 
speaks in a very proper, like, British voice, and he's the one cutting your cake at your birthday party, and he completely destroys it. That's personality. That's yeah. humor. You could have little details like that. We may, we may be getting there. We might have to put in 100 hours into Fallout Shelter <laughs> maybe, before maybe. we get to that point. Maybe. Or, I mean, you know, this is their first foray into the realm, and I'd say that they did a pretty damn good job compared to a lot of people who are putting games out there for mobile devices. I think this just emphasizes... <laughs> <laughs> the mobile gaming is doomed. Like it's just, it's just this it's cesspool. Just the deeper, of the deeper BS. undertone. But you're talking about wanting a, uh, a companion app for Fallout 4. Like they they shown that they can do a lot of things right. First of all, it's playable offline. Right. Nobody does Which that. Which is appreciated. Yeah. When you're on a plane and every single game that you're used to playing is right. just like can't do it, can't do it, can't mm. do it. I just, oh, I just want something that one. that it doesn't make me feel like I'm waiting in line. You know, like you talk okay. about playing it at E3, and that's that's almost ironic to me because it's like. Okay, I'm waiting to play this game, so I'm going to play a game that makes me wait a bunch. Yeah. That, no. That's games. We can do better. Just waiting to wait some more. <laughs> so, Ben Moore says, we can do better. Bloodward says, I may try it. And uh, Blair and I dig it. And that is the popular consensus at GameTillers.com. Thank you, Ben, for having an opinion. I appreciate it. Yeah. Sorry it's so bitter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A couple questions between uh, Just Plates. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good Bring idea. Now we do. All right, I got an easy one for you from Emo Sabi. Uh, can you ask Brandon when his Disney Infinity interview will go up? Uh oh. Uh. <laughs> oh no. My. You've been hyping that up. My Disney Infinity interview has apparently gone up into the ether. What uh, does that mean? Apparently the uh, the card that would the interview was captured on is empty, gone. No. Oh, <laughs> Completely out of my control. <laughs> I oh, went uh, shooting with a camera person and. Uh, Somewhere between so, some of that camera person what have we established so did not far, become responsible for that uh, media, and I lost it. We've established that you didn't forget to press record, right? Right. Yeah. We've established that, well, actually, we haven't established that this building isn't haunted. Right. So that is a possibility. Um, I looked at my apartment for the card. Right. Well, what Nothing. scoops did you get, Brandon? What was the scoop? Uh, uh, I did get a, uh, I got a, well, the one scoop that I got was that, um, uh, they're going to announce... I mean, we know that um, the Toy Box Summit is coming soon. Uh, and they're going to announce that soon. There's a Toy Box that's, Summit. i got to say, that's not a scoop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we do one more question? Sure. I love just Kyle shutting things down. It's <laughs> amazing. Do you think there will be more press conferences next year? Uh, if so, from whom? There's nobody left. Activision? Mm. Activision's left, man. I think that's, it might happen. But they really mm. only have like a couple of things. Well, and, like, they, I don't know. This I year, like... Be fewer. As long as Jamie yeah. Kennedy's not there, maybe. Uh. I can't wait to uh, hear about their deals with Red Bull on stage. It's going to uh. be awesome. Oh, yeah. We can, we, can get it, yeah <laughs> we can get into that later. I actually just I just finally read up on that before we... Kind of the yeah, stage. I think it's Square Enix and PC gaming need to go away next year. Whoa! Whoa! Thanks. Whoa! whoa, whoa. And PC no. gaming. I agree with that. I agree. As okay. those conferences, <laughs> those, those conferences, conferences were oh, those bad. Conferences. Yeah. They, yeah. But they could. The PC one could get better. It was the first year they did it. I, I, I think it will. The PC needs to have a presence at E3. Sure. sure. They just need to not have egos about their presences. Like you just look across the table at other people who are there and see what they're doing right, and just do that stuff. Right. Everybody stands up there and is talking like it's 1998 and they're trying to attract investors and it's killing me. I hate it when they talk to us like we're idiots that don't understand what numbers are. That's every single press conference except for Sony. And even mm -hmm. a couple of people during Sony did it a little bit. But for the most part, they've nailed it. They've gotten it down the past few years. But Microsoft made great strides in years past. This year, back to, the, back yeah. to square one. Nintendo's pretty organized. They don't, Nintendo's Nintendo presentation... Do well. I kind of, like, it's weird. You don't really think of it as a press conference, right? It's, it's more of a presentation. I guess we can call it that from now on. And that, that most of that was pretty fantastic. Say what you will about Muppets. But, like, the, the production quality was there. They clearly have a lot of energy and love what they're doing. And they, were, you know, they respect that this is for the fans. Mm. That was pretty cool. There I, was, I, I love developer commentaries and interviews. Yes. So I love it. It doesn't really have a place at E3. Like, it's mm -hmm. awesome that Miyamoto was inspired for Star Fox by visiting the shrine and, and talking about its arches, but that is space that could have been desperately filled by new game announcements, you know? Like, <laughs> well, I don't, you have I don't to have know the new you're... games to make those announcements. Right, so exactly. So at least they filled it with something entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-mm. <laughs> no. Ben, not have, it's going to take a lot, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Constantly in search for perfection today. Put a smile today. on Ben's no, face. <laughs> it's, I, sound so, I sound so cynical, but... That, 
the rest of the stuff we're talking about. It's good. Into. Yeah, it's, it's gonna good. get better. It's okay. Gonna get better. Okay. All right. I'm actually really curious to hear what you can say about this next one. Oh. Got Joey Kramer. Oh wait, I'm not excited about this one. Whoops. Joey I lied. Kramer. <laughs> oh. Something's happening in the booth. Ian, what's going on back what? there? What's happening in the booth, dog? fine. Yeah. Joey just came in to apologize for the whole room being destroyed. Oh. oh. Thanks, Joey. Guy. Thank you, Joey. So it's your fault. <laughs> All right. More dress plates. And more dress plates. Yeah, you just roll into them. We're, We're just still rolling. rolling. All right, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> ben. Yeah. I don't play the MOBAs. No, you do not. Uh, I probably should. There's lots of different types of MOBAs. You get mm-hmm. your top-down MOBAs. You get your smite, your third-person action MOBAs. Uh, Gigantic is, is a MOBA, is it not? Well, What's MOBA-ish? Is it? They, they, they refuse to call it a MOBA. Okay. Are, is is they... it a hero shooter? <laughs> <laughs> it is... They, they liked talking about Team Fortress more than they, they liked talking about MOBAs, but uh, imagine a Team Fortress MOBA. It is kind of like that. So it's interesting that you, you, that you like, uh, the MOBAs are successful, so mm-hmm. you want to harness kind of that, that multiplayer excitement, but then, you know, so many people like your Battleborns, your Overwatches, like, don't actually want to say the word MOBA. So, mm-hmm. like, you want to be like MOBAs, but you don't want to be a MOBA. Heroes of the Storm actually never, ever refers to itself as a MOBA either. It's crazy. Most MOBAs don't, right? Like, they, they had to be labeled on, like, as that externally by us, really, for us to be able to say it's this type of game. Genre deflection. Like, no, <laughs> screw that genre. Um, but there it, are a it, lot of MOBAs that do call themselves MOBAs. Like yeah. Supernova, right? Yeah. So right out the Super, gate. Supernova <laughs> is very proud that it's a MOBA. Uh, <laughs> it, it, is this a game you should play if you like MOBAs? Uh, well, I didn't, I didn't play it. Okay. I saw it being played, and I, I got a lengthy presentation. And this was one I told Bloodworth before I went to E3. The, the sort of the trailers that they had for it made it look outstanding. The, the cell shaded art style seemed like it had so much life to it. It's, it seemed like something different. And walking away from the presentation, I think it was one of the only things I saw at E3 where I was less excited after they talked to me about it than I was going in. Um, and that's because it just, it just doesn't have a hook, really. The, the, sort of the new stuff that they're doing uh, felt like old things that were a little bit repurposed. And so you, you have two teams. And you're trying to kill their, uh, their guardian, essentially. And the, there are these huge lumbering beasts, and depending on the faction you choose, that's the type of beast you kill. So, you know, in MOBAs, you always have to destroy what I'm going to call a core. And so this is a core that moves around the map. You can actually make mobile and, and attack your enemies. Hmm. And that's cool in theory, but it's still just... It, from what I saw, just this giant thing that you have to shoot. Right. Um, you know? And, and that's, uh, I think, one of the major turnoffs. I saw, I, I, I saw the same presentation that you did, I think, oh, okay. Ben. Uh, didn't play it at E3, but I have played it before. I played it at uh, uh, Comic-Con. And I might have stated this in a video that I recorded after Comic-Con, but it was, without a doubt, the most stressful, headache-inducing appointment that I've ever had for any multiplayer game ever because it seemed wow. like the developers really wanted me to win. It wasn't just that I could like get the game and just have fun with it. They were just like, okay, go, no, go to the left. Okay, do that, no, now, get now. Oh, you died, well, you got it. Now you got to take on the, you know, the, 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 the monster at the end and like now it's, the opportunity's opening up for you to do damage to it. Oh, now the opportunity's gone. Now you got to wait five more minutes. And I was just like, wow, I would just love to just kind of run around it's like if I would go over and like plant myself down, like I'd be like, no, 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 go over there and do it there. And it's like, just let me do it and screw up. Right. So it seemed like there were so many rules that it would be really tough for somebody to jump in. Um, as someone who's experienced with you know heroes and League of Legends and games yeah. like that, did you pick up the, the rule set right away? Like you mentioned, it's, it's kind of seemed like the same game that you're used to, maybe with just with a different coat of paint. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it it feels like it's taking all of these different elements from all these different games, and that's absolutely fine. But to me, I as I was watching it, I felt like I had kind of already played it. Um, it didn't. It didn't have anything that particularly grabbed me. Like the guy that was playing the demo was playing this robot that can transform into a turret, and it's like, man, I, I just saw that in Overwatch, and it's it's <laughs> there, there are other games that do it too, um, and you can. There are these uh, things around the map that you can activate, like they they call them bloomers, and they could they could heal you and and all of that stuff. And 
you know, your characters progress and, and gain new ability. You can make them more offensive or defensive, like they were saying. If you wanted to play a support, but you wanted to be more aggressive, you could pick offensive abilities that uh, allow you to fulfill that role. But I even that, it's like I, I can I can already do that in, in pretty much every other MOBA. And so I kept searching for the thing that would make me excited about Gigantic, and I just didn't get it. And I, I, part of that is because there are so many similar games coming out. We have... Battleborn, we have Overwatch, and it's all of these things coming out at once uh, made it harder, I think, for Gigantic to impress. That me. is just absolutely burying the competition. That do, it isn't like you know, kind of birthed from a, a f existing franchise. I mean, Heroes of the Storm has so much going for it for obvious reasons because all of the major Blizzard characters that we've known for over a decade, right? Like. I look at this right now, and I'm like, I, I actually really dig the art style. I'm I looking do too. at this, and you know, it it almost doesn't matter what type of a game it is because that's kind of what it seems to have going for it. While I'm looking at it, mm -hmm. but when it comes down to it, what am I going to do? Am I going to play it for a little while, and then, like Brandon said, I mean, it's not it's not just you, Brandon. Moba is a very stressful game type. That's just how it is. I mean, you know, when you measure it up against its predecessor, real time strategy, where you actually get a chance to build a base and do things and have control of a situation in a MOBA, it is go do things now and do them right or you lose. And that's, mm -hmm. that's just the way the game is. It makes me feel like there's not really much room for people to change the game a lot. Like you're saying, like the gameplay is pretty much going to be pretty similar. Either you have guns or you have swords and axes. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, capture the flag or kill the base or this, like the only things that you can do with two equal teams on a map that offers equal opportunity for both. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be so precisely balanced that there's just, what are you going to do that's going to change that game type? Right, but when there are so many of those types of games already out, it, it, it makes it difficult. And the other thing that's intrinsic to MOBAs is, guys, they take a lot of time. Not mm -hmm. only do they take a lot of time to learn, but they take an incredible amount of time to play. If you want to become proficient at League of Legends or especially Dota or even Heroes of the Storm, that's an investment, right? And I already try to play as many of those games as possible uh, in addition to everything else that I'm playing. And uh, like if another one comes out and even if it's good, even if the art style is striking, you know, if I can't, if it's not absolutely better than what I'm already playing, how am I going to find time for this? It's coming to consoles, I think. That's that's a yeah. big deal, you know. And that, mm -hmm. that probably was one of the best sells that I've I, uh, I've gotten for this is when I first when I played at Comic Con. I played on mouse and keyboard, and um, because it just seems much more of like an action game that like I'm actually like I'm I'm playing this third person action character running around, kind of like Smite, you know. Like I think right. I think I'd enjoy Smite more on consoles, even though I haven't had time to play it. Um, versus, you know, really micromanaging like one tiny character amidst a bunch of others, having this kind of bird's eye view that I would have uh, of a League of Legends or Heroes of the Storm. Right. So there's that, and uh, uh, I, you know, I didn't get a chance to play it at the demo that I believe, you know, both and I, uh, we got similar appointments, but they did have it at the Xbox party, so I didn't get to sit down uh, and play it, and it does uh, work well with controllers. But I wonder, uh, you know, Blood, you haven't chimed in yet. Um, what would it take for this game to entice you? The, to uh, to, to get you into uh, not only the genre, but gigantic specifically. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that, you know, I'm kind of seeing just looking at it is, you know, like, even though it looks pretty, like, I don't feel like those those characters, like, really stand out as characters. You know, it's like, okay, it's like, I got the deer guy and I got the owl guy, you know, and <laughs> I, it's just, you know, it, it's hard to find the hook in that. And, and I think that's, uh, that's really interesting to me is because, you know, especially like with all the the skins and stuff that that the big guys do with Le League of Legends and and even Smite having all of their different gods, it's mm -hmm. like people really you know get into those characters on multiple levels, um, and I think that's where you know one of the reasons that that Overwatch has kind of been favored over Battleborn is because people are just more interested in in that style. They connect with those characters instantly, mm -hmm. um, and and this kind of you know it has that feeling of like okay, this is some kind of you know, it's an imaginative woodland creature, but it doesn't really like. I don't get who he is just by seeing him really quickly. Is there I think that's an excellent story? point. Is there room for story in MOBAs? You know, <laughs> any time they try to force a story in MOBAs, I, I think to myself, like, no, you just <laughs> let it go. It's I, it's better off if you don't it try to do that. It just takes so much energy to make the balance right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, it's and it's like when you when you're playing a competitive match, 
you don't want to hear a, the entire history of your giant tree. You know, you just don't. You just don't care. You're too busy <laughs> right. getting last tips. But I, you know, like we're watching the trailer a couple of times, and like there are a couple of characters in there that just it strike me pre as pretty cool. It seems like almost there's some influence in some of those characters, and even some of the enemies from like Zelda. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I forget the name, but uh, the the ghost ninja warriors that wear like a giant sheet over them, and they have the dual swords. And I think that's in Twilight Princess. Uh, there's one of the heroes that kind of looks like that. And I'm like, oh, cool. That, that. I, I definitely am more of a fantasy vibe from Gigantic yeah. than I do um, from 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 Smite. You know, like yeah. Smite seems to, you know a little more of like action heavy. Yeah. Um, let's see more like a like blockbuster kind of film. And and to vibe. be fair, I was completely dismissive about Smite. I thought, man, it's another MOBA that's that's trying to enter this ring. Like this this space is already too crowded. Whatever, I'll go check it out. I loved it. I became an avid player after I actually got my hands on it and spent the time to learn all of the systems. And I think that's true for a lot of MOBAs, you know. So maybe when I do play the beta, I will have a completely different opinion. So. And yeah, and I think I probably have to spend a little bit more time with it. Um, just a final note. Uh, I think one of the big you, you mentioned the the core as like you know the the th the thing your objective in mm -hmm. a lot of MOBAs or, or in a, just a, a battle arena type game is you have something in the enemy base that you have to get in and do damage enough damage to yeah so you you can't just do it in one pass it's kind of like the slow battle of attrition you know mm -hmm. to to see who's gonna um, you know finish out ahead on on either side and that I think was the the bummer for me uh, and maybe what I need to experience I'm kind of curious what chat has to say spending more time with the game and that you know you you have this amazing bird creature this big kind of snake-like dragon creature and all I can really do is just do damage to it you yeah. know like and and like yeah I could got to get a sense that it was hurting my team but it, it never really attacked me in any way and like right. when mm -hmm. it was near me I wasn't afraid you know much like I would be in like a Dark Souls or Bloodborne by just seeing this huge, massive monster and realizing like that all this Absolutely. has got to do one attack and I'm dead and maybe just having that fear or or the pride of having like yay my monster is behind me and it just seemed more as kind of like a a, a, a yardage marker in a football yep. game where it was just like okay that's the I can tell I'm winning because my hero is here as opposed to me actually like paying attention to each of its movements and, and what it was doing. That's that's what I was trying to say at the beginning of this thing and I, I completely agree with what you're saying. It, it didn't it didn't feel like a living thing that that mattered beyond being an objective to shoot at and, and maybe, that was a disappointment. Maybe we're wrong. Maybe, maybe. Uh, if we get a chance uh, maybe you check it out on PC I'll check it out on Xbox One and we will yeah. chime back in later. Thank you for your opinions gents. I want to be Damn. more positive. Let's let's get to the part <laughs> yeah, that was that's more positive. It's the same I thing when we talked about uh, that Battleborn. It was just like ah, it's, it is a pretty game. I just would we play a Zelda MOBA on the Wii U? Sure, man. I'd uh, play it. You guys want some questions? Sure. Yeah. So, so question. you actually you did a great job answering everyone's questions that they had for Gigantic. Cool. Really cool. Oh, cool. Uh, ben, so so people want to know what you think of the Persona trailer from today. Oh. Uh, oh, when did that happen? I missed it. Yeah, so uh, in the uh, to a little bit of context, is Persona 4 Dancing All Night came out in Japan today. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, within Persona 4 Dancing All Night, there is a new trailer for Persona 5. Uh, and a lot of people uploaded it to YouTube. It was immediately taken down by Atlas, but they uploaded it on other sites. If you want to see it, go to NeoGAF. It's there. It was really cool. Um, it didn't reveal all that much, which was kind of disappointing. And uh, it reused a lot of the things from the first trailer. But... Man, that, that game still looks amazing. And uh, they had a new track in it, and man, it, it was such a good track. I, I liked the trailer overall. It didn't have the impact on me that the first one did, but still cool. Uh, and then one, one t another tiny question. Uh, when are the trailer scores going up that we recorded, Brandon? After Batman. Here we do it? Oh, yeah, trailer score is going up later this week. I just I'm working on Batman. So right now, was that review. distracting you with this? Uh, no, I was checking. I was I myself was also looking in chat. Oh, okay. Say, you know, <laughs> how many people are tuning in? See if there's any specific questions. Okay. Didn't know that was aimed at me. Sorry, Kyle. No, it's cool. All I, right, we're good. I'd like. It didn't, it didn't seem cool. Oh, sorry. I have one last thing. Uh, Ian, Captain Fantastic Two wants you to know you're doing a fantastic job on the TriCaster. Yeah. <laughs> a <laughs> salute from it. Captain Fantastic. Yeah. Nice. I think that was our, our pre-production time too. The, the official Fantastic Seal of Approval. Fantastic. All right, one more just play, and then we can get into general gaming discussion and chatting with chat. Uh, if you guys are just tuning in now, it is a rather unusual episode of GT Live. We have no special guests. We have no special game. We have no special giveaways. We're giving away E3 knowledge. <laughs> That's what we're giving away. Um, we're recording a couple just plays, and then we are going to just just fly through uh, a bunch of the games that we have checked out and have uh, some, some games I don't even know. 
Yeah, Mother Russia bleeds. No idea what that is. Can't wait oh, to hear man. Ben talk about that. That game is that yeah. game is great. Never heard of it before, Ben. Oh, Can't Mother Russia it. bleeds. We're not talking about that just yet. Calm okay. down. Calm okay. Down. Okay. Okay. All right. One more chess play. <clears throat> you ready, Ian? I'm I know always you're. Ready. I know you're ready. I just like to say it. <clears throat> Mr. Matt Blair, mm. uh, people are talking about Destiny right now. Uh, yeah. For lots of different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, they're saying some good things. They're saying some bad things. We're here primarily to talk about one of the good things, the okay. Taken King, which is the next uh, big expansion due out for Destiny. It's going to be available in September. Uh, I checked it out at E3. Have you checked out any of the Taken King yet? I checked out the multiplayer stuff, which I think was the only thing you could check out unless you had something else. I checked out single player. Oh, okay. That's well, great. then we've so got we're... it covered. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I... Walked almost straight into the multiplayer demo. No wait time. Kyle made fun of me in his most recent episode of Final Bosman for doing that. I understand when you're at E3, there's a ton of new games. Why would you go and play one that you can already play at home? But it was right there. So I figured, hey, why not? Nobody else at Game Trailers is going to do it. So I'll see what's new about it. Here we are. So. But this was Taken King specifically. This was this Taken King. Yep. So, so the, this you, is the content that will not be available for another three months. Yeah. Uh, competitive multiplayer matches. It was it was kind of a new mode, and uh, I had it written down. I didn't bring that with me because I'm unprepared. But um, somebody will have to correct me in, in chat with the name of the mode. But what it basically is is adding modifiers to a mode that you've already got. So like when you load into Mayhem. Mayhem. Thank you. Uh, Mayhem Rumble, I believe it was. So it's like the same old team versus team deathmatch sort of thing but every time you load in there's a new modifier that either gives you like super recharge on grenades or you can have infinite supers or you know stuff like that but Mm. the most important stuff was actually all of the new weapons were available to choose from and uh, all of the new subclasses for each of the three characters and if you don't know there are kind of four elemental or no sorry three elemental types in destiny and up to this point you could choose between two of them for each class they finally are just unlocking the third essentially, so that it kind of rounds out every character that have, like, void damage or, you know, solar damage, that sort of thing. I played Hunter because it was my least favorite class in general uh, so far, and I just wanted to see what they were bringing to it, you know? And it's actually kind of awesome. It, it, adds, a, it adds quite a bit of depth, actually, to a class that was otherwise just kind of meh, for me, at least. Uh, but the the super, you guys may have seen it in, like, the trailer, is, like, this purple glowing bow and arrow and he's just running around in midair doing cool action shots shooting it or whatever which I found myself instantly trying to reproduce in the middle of a multiplayer match (laughs) great idea yeah but it's actually pretty fun because it's not even it's not a bow and arrow that you shoot somebody with it's you shoot the ground next to them and then tethers them in place and I'm like okay wait a minute Mm. we're we're in a multiplayer shooter it's it's halo destiny multiplayer it's kind of all the same you're just shooting to kill or whatever but then I found myself just doing really cool tricks where like Somebody jumps over me. is like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I got excited. Um, but I, put, I pinned them to the ground, and then somebody else would just come up and melee them right in the face. And I'm like, this is really cool. I'm getting yeah, assists. Nice. I'm having fun getting assists in a multiplayer shooter right now. Yeah, Kyle, Kyle didn't like uh, tying me to the ground and evolve. But, you know, I think it's a good mechanic. Uh, yeah, and the, the Night Stalker is the name, yeah. of, the name of this new uh, subclass. For to say, hunters. anytime you, you put a bow in your game, I'm on board. Right? Yeah, there's, yeah. Something, there's something about a bow. That Especially for a hunter class. Yeah. Really. yeah more yeah, satisfying than, than firing a gun. And easy, something that they could put in the trailer. You just see, like, one of the Guardians just, that, you know, I saw it in that. the trailer when they showed it off. I had, like, just enough time to look up and grab that. And I'm like, interesting. I went right for it. And, you know, it turns out it's actually pretty cool. The other, the other subclasses I didn't get too much time with, but obviously they killed me a bunch uh, while we were playing. Um, but... They do kind of the things that you would expect or the things that you'd hope for. So the Titan's power is like a giant hammer, but you could throw it, right? So the Titan has a super that's actually got, like, decent range to it. I'm just thinking he's of always the, been missing that. the Diablo II Paladin. Just hammers everywhere. Yeah. Yep. Good stuff. And uh, I actually, I kind of forget the, the Warlock's power, but he's... Uh, the Titan's was Sunbreaker. Oh, and the force. warlock was storm color. Storm color, chain color lightning. Sounds good. Which is, this is like it is actually it's cool to watch, but it's kind of tough to use. Are we showing? it? I think we just saw it. Yeah. yeah okay. So you you activate oh, there's the it. Hammer. There's the hammer. That's the titan, and um, for the warlock, you kind of activate this like force lightning power for a period of time, and it just turns into chain lightning. And so if you have a group, uh, the, the destiny mode that 
has you doing capture points. This mm-hmm. is kind of perfect for that because you have like three people holding down a point. You just turn this on and you're just damaging everybody from afar and you're just like, ah, Emperor, kill you. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of, uh, they've gone for the visually satisfying things, which is nice. You know, you, you get just kind of an instant feedback from just using it, but also kind of rounding out gameplay. That I got good vibes from most of that stuff. It, it, all of the supers definitely overshadowed the new weapons which were added, which were just kind of like, it's cool that you can have a game that we've been looking at for two years, and when you bring out a new batch of weapons where they add like a new type of sight on it that is noticeably different, or when you see like the new weapon from that same company that you had a few weapons before and you just see like the upgrades that they made from version to version to gun. That's it, like, in terms of the small stuff, that's really minute. But at the same time, if you appreciate that sort of thing, it's actually really satisfying to see. So that, uh, that whole part of the experience was nice. That was the nice stuff that I saw from Destiny this year. I absolutely love how overtly dorky destiny is i mean <laughs> sunbreaker and stormcaller yeah. that sounds like it's out of a D player's handbook and that <laughs> like it's a thumbs up to me uh the outfits were very dd i'm a hunter it's kind of funny the hunter was your least favorite class it's my favorite class in destiny uh i definitely gravitate i mean anything is, that's called hunter i'll sign up for immediately uh i liked the i didn't pay attention to the outfits but i like the hunter outfit i'm assuming the outfit they put us in is the the newest upgraded the new hotness. Uh, the hunter was all green, and he had like a hood, like Robin Hood style. Had a little feather in his nice. on his hood, uh-huh. a little green arrow. Uh, actually, so yeah, it was yeah, it's very uh, very green arrow esque. Um, and then there's the the taken enemy. So I played uh, single player. Mm-hmm. So I got in with uh, the AI a little bit, and they have um, uh, what's neat is that there's you know they they have they have different versions of the same enemies that we're familiar with, but uh, the um, these are taken version of them, and the the single player mission that I played was kind of spooky, actually, and it was it was interesting because I, th- I thought that's something that Destiny had in parts, but uh, definitely like favored more of the action vibe. Um, I just played it solo, but you can obviously you know it's a it's a it's a mission, so I imagine you can play it uh, multiplayer as well. Um, but uh, so they had the, the the same characters, so like I don't know what your like rank and file peon is in in, in Destiny uh, and the uh, amongst the fallen, but. Uh, uh, they could split in this one. So if you uh, didn't take out the original guy, he's going to keep tossing out copies. Mm-hmm. So I was fighting a boss, and he had a bunch of these guys around, and they kept splitting, and I just completely wasn't paying attention to it and then realized like, halfway through the fight, like, I need to manage this. Otherwise, like, these guys are going to constantly keep spawning out. And then uh, whoever the guys are with the big shields... Uh, they had a thing where, like, the shield would fire. It would cause, this, like, this big vortex, so you couldn't... You know, before, you would just, like, oh, I want to get a sniper rifle and, and try to get a good shot on these guys. Um, and uh, they their shield would then, you know, have a big, like, wind-up attack that you could see, like, charging up, so you had to jump out of the way. And then there were other guys that had a fire toss. So if you were behind cover and they hit... And this thing hit, like, just two feet away from you, then it would, like, light the ground on fire and spread, so you, like, couldn't stay in cover. Hmm. So it's just, like, to keep you moving. Uh, and it was cool because, you know, I would see I'd be, I would see the enemy type and I'd be like, oh, cool, that enemy type. And then be like, yeah, but he's kind of like translucent and like dark in spots and like ghostly. And then like all of a sudden here comes this crazy attack I'm not used to. Hmm. Um, so I thought that was cool. And that was something that they were excited about with all the, the, the taken version of these standard characters. And the, the other thing that I liked about the, the single player mission that I played was... Uh, something definitely like just happened. Like I was like, going to a base that had just been taken out by these by the, the you know the taken version of these aliens. Uh, there were there were like rifts in space in various parts of the station. So like you would go and it literally looked like like the fabric of time and space got like torn open and like you could see like a universe through there. Kind of like the caverns of time in World of Warcraft. Nice. It kind of had that vibe, but much more of like a doom like you know like the shit just hit the fan in this in this laboratory basically. Um, and it was cool because like a lot of the vibe that I got in Destiny is that this is a really cool video game environment that we're exploring, but like I don't buy this as an actual like I don't buy that we're on Mars. We're just playing a really fun video game on Mars right now. <laughs> Whereas this area definitely felt like a place it definitely felt like something just happened. That mm-hmm. I was like discovering this area at a specific moment in time and that this wasn't like you know, the desert land, Disneyland, and we're all just kinda of going there running our bikes around. Oh me. no. Never mind. Um <laughs> Uh, but I feel like I could have warned you. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're rolling, be rolling that one, Ian. Um, <laughs> we missed we missed the spill, but 
Yeah, we heard the noise. It's all right. Good momentum. Fast and um, loose. But uh, it, so I, I like that it feels like a moment in time. That definitely mm-hmm. felt like it felt like a real place that I was going to that this thing was happening at. And so uh, that seemed like an improvement, kind of more of story focused. Sure. At the end of it, it was like, oh, we got to get out of here. And then we, we like exit into most of it was an interior it exit into this huge open area where like ships were flying by and shooting at each other. And it was like, oh, we got to get to our ship and escape. So, again, it definitely felt like this was a place of this world and a place of a bigger story. Uh, and I don't know if that's one of the first missions that we that you get to take on, or if it's a later mission. Uh, definitely introduced. Uh, who's the guy that we pissed off in an earlier? We like killed his son. Oryx. Oryx. Yeah, definitely pissed off Oryx. He appeared, uh, and uh, his head appeared over us in, in, in one section. And he was yelling at us, um, <laughs> but uh, did a good job. Kind of remind me of Lich King in Warcraft, where like did a good job of like being like, "This is the guy. This, you're gonna fight him later. Not now. You're gonna fight him later." Right. He's gonna, he spawned like the Watcher of Oryx or something, and then that's the guy that I fought. Gotcha. But, um, you're like selling the, me. Yeah, like yeah. the creepy vibe. I, I hope they I hope they stay with the creepiness. It definitely seemed like uh, scary enemies were the order of the day in the Taken King. So I'm kind of curious where they take that See, and run with it. It's the, kind of funny to me that. To me, anyway, it was introduced as a new race, but it's classic Destiny to be like, hey, we're giving you new content, but it's the exact same stuff, just backwards. And now it's like, (laughs) basically the new race is just all the other races, black and white. (laughs) Yeah. It is kind of interesting, right? Like you, it's become more and more obvious as time goes on that like... They, they're they trying to squeeze as much out of this like the work that they're doing as possible which makes sense from a business model but at the same time when you can notice it so blatantly and upfront this is why everybody's making so much noise these days and i i understand that i completely do and i'm i'm not a fan of them coming out and then like saying all right so this game that you've all just hasn't even been out for a full year yet here's and they're not even calling it destiny 2 right they're calling it new expansion blah 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 it's not a new disc it's not that not a new installment or anything like that the trends that they're following to do this are not not new to us we have a yearly call of duty franchise from activision like all the season passes and paying money tons and tons of money to just get as much out of the game as you want out of the game these aren't new concepts to us definitely some people just don't do it because they don't really care about this year's call of duty but suddenly when you have destiny here which has got the bungee track record it's a new game. It's uh, what else can I say about it that makes it just different? It's not different though, because this is just Activision's business model. What I what really does truly bother me about them doing this is their attitude in doing so. Right? It's kind of a mistake for you to have your only source be the. I think it was the games director that made some comments or something like. There was an interview that went slightly off course, and like there was some attitude being given from a journalist. Right. That's not what you're there to do. But, you know, you're, you're still asking the questions that the, the people you're talk, reporting to are going to ask. So I get it. But the attitude coming from mostly Activision, it just feels like it's, you know, a PR and marketing stunt asking for money. It's not that you're not going to get your money's worth from Destiny because you could play it for hundreds of hours and everybody can and has. When you pull up your Destiny app and it tells you you've spent six days in game, it's like Jesus. Well, yeah, okay, and I've spent a hundred bucks on this. You know, you know, divide that by how many hours per dollar or whatever. Yes, you're gonna get your money's worth with this stuff. That's not the problem. I think they just they didn't they don't expect the backlash just because of probably the attitude in which they're presenting that information to us or not presenting it. And you want to get a sense that they're learning, you know, that like yes. every single time they come no. out with, that they, what, no, you want to get a sense of that. You yeah. Know, that like you're looking that, for it. That every time they yeah, come out with a new expansion, clearly not. that it's going to be better than the last one. That, and, that and, interview was hilariously <laughs> awful. Yes. And then the day after to come out with this Red Bull crap. <laughs> right. Like, no, Super that, it is, it, it feels like they are just shitting on their fans, and yeah. it's gross. Like, I, as cool as Taking King sounds, like, first it comes out at $40, and everyone's like, hmm, that seems a little pricey for what you're offering. Right. And then it's like, here's this exclusive stuff that you can't get unless you rebuy what you already own. And then here we're doing this Red Bull promotion that comes with an exclusive mission. It, like, no. It's like the world wants to love Destiny, and Bungie just isn't letting them. They're just putting all of this the, the the funny thing nonsense like, in the way. The funniest thing is that it would be so easy to fix. 
Like, if you see everyone's pissed that you have to pay $80 to get a dance emote, you say, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, we misspoke. Everybody gets the dance emote, even if that wasn't true. You just say that. So Problem everyone, solved. No, we got something from chat, actually. They just announced that they apologize for the interview, mm -hmm. and you can buy those emotes, you can buy the dances for $20. <laughs> what? As a, like a, a dance pack? What so did you just say? You, you can buy three dances for twenty dollars. Yeah, so there you don't were forty have to, before. You don't have to get the legendary edition. But they will give you the privilege of paying twenty dollars <laughs> yes, for them. Yeah. Right. God. <laughs> oh. Geez. Wow. The funny thing is. <laughs> wow. It's too bad everyone's gonna do it. Well, yeah. We're all fucking. But nobody idiots. gives Wait, a you're shit. gonna do it? Everyone's gonna do Are it. Are you going to do it? It depends on what it is. Uh, if my, if they're dance emotes. Sick new dance. Guys, Twenty dollars is way too fucking much. Guys, I'd pay three dollars for that maybe. Guys, Ben's Ben's <laughs> relinquishing the headphones, but I know you can still hear me. Ben, you're gonna pay ninety dollars for Hearthstone hero uh, portraits. <laughs> that didn't quite. We come don't out know right. what that first, is. First of all, they're ten dollars a piece. Oh, yeah, boy. ninety dollars total. <laughs> mm -hmm. But like, people are. That paying doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it. No, okay. I know. I'm, just, I'm agreeing. I'm like, saying this is all terrible. But this, we're bad at voting with our wallets. Yes. So it's gonna keep happening. This sort of thing has been done for a long time. This is not new to us. Even Blizzard charges you twenty-five dollars for a horse. Mm -hmm. That you just like because it looks cool and it's not faster. It doesn't carry more. It's just a horse. But people, you know, some people would say, "Oh, that's stupid." Some people will say the same things they're saying about Destiny. But this is so loud about Destiny. Right, but yes, video games suck. That you absolutely. But what what makes this especially egregious is they had this huge backlash. Yeah. And they come out and say <laughs> that you can charge twenty dollars for it. You know, it's one thing to come out there and charge for something that's way too much. But then in your apology to charge way too much for something in a different way, yeah. like what world do we live in? That's insane. <laughs> let, me, let me clarify this. I'll break it down just a slightly different way. Uh, recently, the best example of something like this would be CD Projekt Red with Witcher 3, right? While they made enough effort to try to tell you that all of the extended content and support for this game will be free because we respect you. And they, they hit that right on the nose, right? They had inserts in the game and everything like that. They, they've made it very clear that they want to stand apart from the people who are just trying to grind money out of you tooth and nail, just every possible way. Because obviously Destiny didn't lose money for the box copies, right? Right. So they can't call it a loss if they don't do microtransactions. Let me just set that record straight right now. They don't need to do this, but they want to do it because they want to impress every chain up to the top at Activision saying, we made this much money last year because we're awesome and we figured out the business of it all. And yes, that's actually, that's the business that they run. When we buy those games that we, we, we have to expect this stuff from now on from that company until they do stuff like CD Projekt Red where they say, we genuinely are you, we respect you, we want to make a good game, and we don't want you to feel like you're a victim from buying our game. Like, there it's, are people out there that do the opposite end of that spectrum, and that's great. Yeah, but why does it feel like they're in the minority? Weird, right? Yeah. Everybody just really wants to make money. I, I'm not saying that people aren't justified in making a lot of noise over Destiny. I think that this is something that should be a larger conversation that probably should happen in a civil fashion, going forward now you know I, people find it so difficult to hold the wallets in their pants and not pay for things like this even though they can complain about it maybe we need to figure out a better way to just kind of discuss this often in a civil fashion instead of youtube comments maybe we find a different way to group together and say we don't want well, it's funny, like, like a lot of Activision's major initiatives now are all microtransaction based. They have Guitar yeah. Hero Live, the Skylanders, and Destiny, you know, like a lot of their things yeah. are like, you have the core experience and then all these other little things you can buy. So but I, I think Activision's got to got to wise up and how to communicate. Destiny doesn't deserve that because the, the, the game has a ton of awesome stuff and it has a really a team of talent, people working on it that clearly care about it. That some of these decisions that are like making an uproar aren't their fault. That, that's not how I felt when I played Destiny. Really? Like when I when I finished Destiny, I was like that that was it. These three planets, you're just gonna make me do the same things over and over again. You're gonna make me grind rep for New Year. Like I felt 
as though Destiny did not have enough in it. Yeah. And so you're going to give me more stuff, but you're going to make me jump through ridiculous hoops to get it? That's that's insane. And think about the, the bungee of, of days past, right? Think about think about Halo 3. Think about how much stuff yeah. was in Halo 3. It's ridiculous. You know, how many years passed when people were still making new game types out of Forge? I would uh, like to take this moment to thank our viewers for joining us for Destiny Cast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, good, good, yeah. Good chat. Good, good opportunity to wrap things up. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Mr. Blair, for a passionate conversation on Destiny. <laughs> Wrapping it up. Cool. Uh, ben, we'll, we'll, on GT time tomorrow, we'll cover this even more. Okay. <laughs> Ian, Ian just seems upset. I don't get it. Huh? Mr. Mr. Brad Ellis. It's upsetting. It just went on for a half an yeah. hour. It was a long time. Hey, it's a big deal. May I have a paper towel, sir? A paper towel? Yes. Yeah. yeah. A paper towel? All right, so towel? I have a question for Matt. We had a spill. Hi. Why do you prefer Destiny to Borderlands? Ooh. Oh, we had our out, Bossman. No, no. This we is were not... out. We oh, were out, the and questions... you keep bringing us back in. Yeah, this is just GT Live Chat. This is just GT Live yeah. Chat. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, I don't think that I do, except for the fact that you can play Destiny with different groups of friends in different modes and stuff. Borderlands can get kind of old pretty quick because there's kind of one way to play it, right? It's either four players or less, and it kind of doesn't matter which weapons you pick up. I don't. I wouldn't say. I'm not saying that Borderlands is bad. I would just prefer Destiny because it's easier to pick up and play for 20 minutes, or it's easy to pick up and play for a few hours and do a raid, or you can go and do a few strikes. Like, oh, why are you just slightly more satisfying? That to the that camera, way. not to me. <laughs> oh, you're 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 my channel to the crowd. All right, I got another, I got another question from Jabroni Jones. Great name. Wow. Uh, that last one was from El Luchadork. Brad uh, likes it. Brad Kit likes it. Bloodworth. Yeah. What are your feelings on Project Cars announcing a crowdfunded sequel before all the DLC is released for the first? I'm seeing quite a bit of salt from its fans. Uh, well, yeah, those fans supported and waited for that game forever. So it's kind of, yeah, it's like, oh, you finally got it out. And, oh, start on two. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's odd. I, I don't think it's a good idea. You know, it was like, start making the game first and then... Uh, worry about it. yeah it's just weird because it makes you feel I think it makes you feel like they're just going to be perpetually begging for money rather than you know getting momentum off of selling the game now that it's out there do you think it didn't sell enough the first one it's, um, it's weird for them to crowdfund a sequel I feel like yeah I mean I think that's I mean I think that's the case with any kind of you know project that's crowdfunded like when you get to the next one and like oh you need crowdfunding again you know um but uh, yeah, I don't I don't know the full dynamics of it. It just uh, uh, a month after the release is not a good time to announce the sequel. It just yeah. isn't. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a lot more that can be done with that game. That is kind of a crazy concept too. Of like when you crowdfund a game and you release it, uh, you know, especially one that's really loud. I mean, Shenmue is in the middle of its own right now. Like when you when you kickstart a game and you make the money to make the first one most of the people who actually contributed to your game are getting your game as in they've already purchased it, right? Yeah. Like the, the core audience that you're going for, in a sense, has already bought the game. So are you counting on the profits from people who hadn't kickstarted it to make you the extra money to move you to another project? That's an interesting kind of weird little concept that I guess maybe we just haven't gone through enough of these kickstarts to really know how that process works for people, huh? Yeah. All right. Well, we got about a dozen more games to go. Okay. <laughs> then we're not, then we're not, not going to do official just plays on any of these, yeah. but we do need to talk about them. And we have less than, we have 22 minutes to talk about all Lightning these. Do we want to get, do we we can do it super fast. Here. Let's um, get Brad in here. Yeah. Bradley Ellis. Uh, but we'll start. Uh, Mr. Matt Blair. Yeah. Brad, um, Brad didn't play this, but so. But the three of us played uh, a little bit Halo 5. Uh, and I've talked about Halo 5 yeah. previously because I'm talking about uh, Warzone, uh, which I thought was super cool. 
My but, session uh, actually it didn't play. I don't know what was you had the experience one, right? Right. So the experience was you got to do some cool AR stuff that led into a Warzone demo. Is that cool AR stuff to Hololens? Yes. Oh. It was Hololens. So yeah, we should talk about Hololens. What was was that cool or mm -hmm. was that dumb? No, it was amazing. <laughs> it was incredible. Not dumb at all. Uh, so they they put on this Hololens headset. And the first thing you see is you see a halo waypoint. It's like it just exists in the ether, and you walk toward it. And then you go into a room, and they're like, look through here. And this little <laughs> visor opens up, and you can see a pelican flying. And you're like, wow, this is, this is amazing. It looks like it's actually out there. Um, and then you kind of go into this war room. And they, uh, the, the field that you're going to play on in this Warzone demo rises up out of this table, right? Just like it seemed in the Minecraft demo. And uh, you hear... Jennifer Hale talking, uh, the, her Spartan kind of comes up and appears, and she's like pointing at you, and uh, you see all of the different points of interest on the map, and it was like, I need this, I need this. I wish everybody <laughs> could <have> this. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I actually, I probably got the most boring, I was got like all the, the info dump, but that, that session. You, you probably got that one too later on. Uh, where you just kind of like sit in the room and they like the tell you everything and then they kind of do like a slow-mo version of the stuff that was in the press conference. For Warzone? Um, no, this was, it was like they went over the campaign and everything. No, I they, you they, didn't get that. I think I was thrown into Warzone and then they booted me out. Oh, okay. It was super quick. So I'm probably the only one that can really go on to these campaign details, although they're probably widespread at this point. But, Make them quick. Um, no, what, what thing was, one thing that's really weird to me is this whole idea of like, being in a, a squad and like everybody having character and stuff, like what do you think about that, Ben? Like, like being no longer a solo master chief, but like being in this group and like giving squad commands and that sort of thing. I agree that uh, it's it's weird, and I, I can't envision it based on all the other Halo games that I played. But if you look at Halo Five and everything that they're doing, it seems like they desperately want to go in a different direction, and I think. That's something I appreciate it about the most. Maybe it won't work. Maybe these other squad members, maybe Nathan Fillion is, will get on my nerves. <laughs> but at, at least it's something different, right? And I, I desperately think Halo has needed that for a while. Uh, Brad, you, would you want to do a four-player co-op Halo? Absolutely. Yeah. I love co-op campaigns. Brad, Brad is like... One of the best people to co-op with. Can I just say that? <laughs> out of the game? I do it for, for the, the team. Record. Like he doesn't whine, uh, and he never sucks, right? Like very he just, positive. Oh, he attitude. just gets in there and uh, gets things done. And I very positive that. attitude. Yeah. And he's good at video games. Um, another thing they said in there that I thought was actually interesting is uh, they're going away from map packs. Um, I mean, huh. not really going away from them in a sense, but. Um, they're not going to charge for them. They're going to be more like how uh, I think Killzone has done this before, where like the maps are all just going to be free, and they're talking about having 15 uh, at least maps that wow, come out great. after launch. So, but they yeah they really said they don't want to split up the player base. They don't want to have people fragmented. That's a good sign. What, what's what's the win there on their end though? Why can't why all of a sudden? How can they all of a sudden just not charge for those? I don't I don't know. I think I don't know how else they make their money on, on that on that back end, but. I, you can see that, yeah, you want people to stay active. You want people to be able to play together. So there's definitely a benefit there to where, you know, you're going to be able to p keep playing the game and not feel like you're left out. Uh, but, yeah, I don't – I'm not sure – clear how that that makes more money other than people don't take it back to GameStop that's a good question we'll make a note <laughs> Civilization Beyond Earth Rising Tide yeah and more mm -hmm. I love Civilization give me, give me the deets I wish I wish I could tell you really interesting details it was one of the shortest uh, demonstrations that I had and we still have no video they said almost nothing really uh in their announcement, they're like, you can colonize on the sea, and we're revamping diplomacy. And I think diplomacy is the thing they need to fix in the game. Nice. Because so often it's like, you're mad at me and you're doing all of these things, but it's not really clear why, and you just feel like this artificial opponent, not, not like a human being that I'm actually trying to reason with. Um, and they showed that you'll be able to more clearly see how everyone feels about everyone else at a glance. So it's nice uh, having that information Not more readily for, accessible. Not only for Beyond Earth, but just Civ. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be good. That's, mm -hmm. why, that's why I got bummed out on Beyond Earth, because I got attacked for no reason by someone who was up until that point But they didn't, they didn't show how they're fixing that stuff. It's like, cool, I can s more easily see who they're mad at, but they didn't go into the why. Like, why is this person acting completely irrationally? Uh, they, didn't, they didn't talk about it. And they showed that you could colonize on the sea, um, but 
they didn't go into what implications that would have other than it's going to change everything. Um, so I don't know what Beyond Earth is bringing. Uh, in the interview that I did, they mentioned uh, hybrid affinities, which is really cool. So in Civilization Beyond Earth, you have three different affinities. Harmony, where you, you kind of choose to assimilate with the alien life. You have purity, where you reject all of that stuff and you try to remain true to your Earth roots. Uh, and then you have uh, supremacy, where you become a super technologically advanced civilization with giant robots and all that stuff. And he, it, it's very, like, I pick this and there's not really any room for anything else. What's cool about hybrid affinities is you can, you get more options, right? So you're like, I like some of this stuff some from Supremacy, I like some of this stuff from Harmony. You can mix them uh, based on how you go through the tech web, which is also but, being But redesigned. Harmony and Purity feel so opposite, like talking about doing a merger of that, like that's, that sounds weird. It does, from a, from a, I don't want to say lore, but from a context perspective, it does sound really weird, but I, I do think gameplay wise beyond earth needs more interesting decisions as you're going through. Yeah. So from, from that perspective, I appreciate it. Hollow point. Yeah. What is this game? Yeah. Uh, so it's made by Ruffian games, which, uh, they made crackdown Two. So whatever you think of that, uh, <laughs> the guy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy spent 15 minutes explaining the systems to me. But basically, it's this side-scrolling third-person shooter where you can click the right mouse button and look in the distance. You shoot guys like in the background, um, and it's it's all about loot. It's all about customization. You can level up your weapons. You can level up your characters. Uh, you can prestige uh, because there's there's 90 points sort of on your skill tree. Uh, but when you first go through, you can only hit 30 of them. So if you prestige you sort of start over, but you get a maximum number of points, more a higher number of points that you could put in. So instead of putting 30 in, you can put 40 in and, and grow that way. But it's, it just, there was nothing to it. It was incredibly easy. It wasn't that much fun shooting the guys, and it just seemed like, man, if you really love putting skill points into things, this is the game for you. But there was, uh, it just... Like everything you were fighting, they just looked like generic future soldiers, and it did not leave a very strong impression. Hmm. So that well, is how I feel about it. Then I won't make you talk about it any longer. There we go. Anymore. Lightning <laughs> round. Soma, I am curious about. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is there more to this? This is, is it, where we bring the hype. Yeah. So is there more to this than amnesia in space, or is that just good enough? Great way to frame this. I don't know. Uh, but I also think that's just good enough. So in my demo, there was nothing that jumped out at me, but there could have been if I handled this approach a different way. Mm. Uh, so it is very much like Amnesia where you're in first person, but you're on a space station. And like Amnesia, the way you interact with things is like if you're turning a wheel, you actually have to, you can't just hit a button and it will turn. You actually have to like drag it and turn it. Uh, so things have a lot of weight and physicality to them. Par pardon me. Are you in space or under the ocean? Yo, I'm sorry. You, yeah, sorry. I thought you were under the you ocean. You are in like a space station thing. You're in a very futuristic thing, but you are under the ocean. Oh, okay. That is correct. Um, I, yeah, I, I guess I just saw the footage that I thought it was Yes. If space. you didn't know you were under the ocean, you would assume that you were in space based Got on it. your environment. Absolutely. Um, Good catch, Ian. Yes. There was Thanks. this robot that I ran into that thought it was a human. Nice. And Soma is a game where you just, you don't necessarily know where to go, so you sort of poke and prod at the environment. And I was talking to him, and I, I was saying, like, no, you are a robot. And he's like, you're insane. I'm being crushed by this, this metal object. Get me out of here. I'm in extreme pain. And I went over, and I flipped this electrical switch, because I'm like, I just want to see what this does. It started electrocuting him, and he was screaming in mm. pain, and it was completely terrifying. Um, and he's like, why, why did you do that? I just want to find this person that I'm interested in. And it made it seem like, uh, like a significant other he was looking for. And so you have all of these questions going on in your mind. You're like, why, why does that robot think he's a human? Is this just me, or is it him? Um, and as I was talking to the guy, that's what they want to do. The, Soma is a game, maybe like PT in a sense, or amnesia, where what you're seeing can be interpreted in multiple ways, and it will constantly make you question yourself. And mm. that's pretty exciting. Hey, can you hear me? 
And you, you, you got the vibe that the game can continue doing that based on the little slice of it that you played? Yes, absolutely. And I think what separates it from Amnesia is the way that I solved this puzzle is I electrocuted the robot human uh, to... Because, because I, I, I diverted power, essentially. So by electrocuting him, I could turn on another switch somewhere else. There was another way that I could have solved that puzzle. And if I did, I would have encountered the monster. But because I didn't do it that way, I never ran into him. So if you have a game that's exactly like Adnesia, that's able to capture that level of tension and terror, but then you have really interesting branching paths, that's pretty cool. Uh, and pretty cool that you can potentially not see a monster in a demo at E3. Yeah. Because if you had a monster in your game, you would want to throw that at everybody, I imagine, right? <laughs> and uh, just just the atmosphere of it, n not that much happened, but I was I was scared the entire time. So how did you find out about that? Did you ask them afterwards, like... Yeah, you know, he told me. Oh, he, he told, told you, me. okay. <laughs> it was one of those things where the guy is sitting behind you and he's like, mm, interesting, interesting, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Yoshi's Woolly World, as long as we're talking about terrorizing yeah, man. underwater... Sci-fi first per no, I got nothing. Um, <laughs> Yoshi's Woolly World. Uh, Blood, you checked it out? Yeah, very good to play it too. Yep. I play, I play with Omar. We did some co-op. Um, you know, I think it's one of those things where you know you 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 have that a little bit of griefing going on, but uh, but still, like there's a there's a lot where you have to kind of work together, and because because you know that that just that mechanic of being able to um, use somebody as an egg when you run out of eggs, just like it it forces you into that co-op. It's like there's no eggs here. Okay, I'll just eat you, you know, and throw you up there at the key. Um, and uh, I don't know which which stage do you got to play. We did the uh, one with like the curtains on it. I think it's the same one you guys played. Yeah, we played that one, uh, and then there's this one that's on the screen right now in the cave. Um, but the, the other one is really great because it, it was like a ghost house kind of thing. Um, and, and the curtains, uh, only when the curtains were in front of the platforms could you actually stand on the platforms. So it was just really tricky to get around. It was pretty challenging, especially to do that in, in co-op. Um, but, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty standard Yoshi platformer, but it, it, it's got the, the yarn tricks in it. It looks really good. There's this thing where we were, like, digging through styrofoam at one point with, like, the mole tanks. Um, and, uh, wait, and then, mole tank. Yeah. You got a mole tank. Yeah. What? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to checking it out. I don't understand just from the two levels I played. I don't understand uh, why some people are kind of dogging on it, but, uh, you can't think of anything. What are they saying? Hmm? What are they saying? I just been hearing it's, it's people have been kind of like thumbing it, is, it down. It has not been scoring super well, Right. but this is one of those games, one of the few games where I want to play through it just because of the Yeah, there's looks. the shadow level. Like, so cool. That's so cool. Yeah, and then you just, yeah. Omar got trolled. Yep. He just died there. So That game really surprised me on how fun it was, actually. I thought it was going to be super easy mode, kind of like Kirby's Epic Yarn, which is a cool game. Too casual you, for Brad. Exactly. Yeah. You can't <laughs> die in it or anything. There's no challenge. But me and Mike were dying left and right, accidentally killing each other. <laughs> Not surprised. And it gives just the amount right of sabotage you can pull on your partner. Like, Kyle would have a really good time playing that game. I yeah. don't know. He doesn't. He doesn't like uh, Mario co-op. Well, he likes if you could sabotage co-op. It he doesn't feel can. as Is that true? like even though you can collide with each other, it doesn't feel like that annoying franticness of right. Mario. Oh, we were frantic when we were playing. <laughs> Kyle, are you are you down for Woolly World? I'm uh, I'm semi down. We gotta stream semi it. Semi down. We gotta yeah. stream it. That's good. We'll so stream you, it. You'll stream for like half an hour and then you're out. Yeah, I, I explained though that we won't go so far as to import it though. Full playthrough ah, Friday. Man. Oh right, yeah. Is it is it legitimate to be tired of Nintendo 2D games at this point? No, that is not no, legitimate. Is, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. That's, that's I the, won't even humor the thought. <laughs> <laughs> the question is: it, Is the, it legitimate? Like, no, no legitimacy in that specific critique on Nintendo. <laughs> we'll hear none of it. Um, Battleborn. We we just talked about it a little bit because we were talking about shooter MOBA. Mm -hmm. stuff you said you changed your your opinion a little bit i did Whoa. yeah so. I, i'm curious to I mean, hear this I, I went from total apathy to semi-interest so <laughs> that was the kind of shift that i had uh it it played really well and there were ideas in it that i i liked you know we didn't play we played a co-op map essentially and so yeah. we were working through this huge level and 
you know, it, it had a nice progression to it. It wasn't like we were just going to one thing. It was like, okay, now you need to open the store. Now you need to take this giant tank that you can upgrade as it's moving and uh, fight this giant boss at the end. All of that stuff was, was really cool. And I, I liked the character that I was playing. So I was playing this snarky British robot that could summon an owl named Houdini to go and attack <laughs> my enemies. Like, that's, that's yeah. cool. Uh, the one downer that I had uh, is that the humor was, like... Yeah. Egregiously awful. I was like, wondering about that. Like it, it was one of the, it was one of those things that was trying so hard and overtly to be funny at all times that it just came across as annoying. Maybe that was just me and my taste. And no, well, yeah, I, me, I mean, but... this the, the demo that you're looking at. I played that three times in a row, and like, yeah, by the second time, you know, the joke, all the jokes fell flat. Yeah. You know, like even yeah. the ones that that hit, you know, fairly well. The first and actually, time. I think that's a fair point, right? Because because you have the competitive side of it. But then a lot of this is is co-op. Yeah. But it's co-op. It, it, there's a there's a story. There to is a it. story. Yeah. There's a story to it, but it's still designed to where you can just kind of jump in at, at any point. Like anyone mm-hmm. can can do that over and over again. So I imagine like after the third time, it's like I don't want to hear. No, any of absolutely this not. Like imagine Borderlands Two humor, but in a game where you have to hear things constantly. That's what it is. Uh, one thing I did really like, just from a mechanical <laughs> uh, that's perspective, that's a no from Brad Ellis. Nope, official no from Brad Ellis. I, I like Borderlands, but uh, the re- repetition. I repetition. Don't know. Yeah. 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 Uh, the one really, really quick thing that I super liked. I hate in games where you can sort of level up your characters and you have to pause the action to wait for your friend to do it. It just it just interrupts the flow and and it gets old after a while. In Battleborn, when you level up, you have two options, and you can just do it super, super quickly. It's like, okay, I bring up the menu as I'm moving, and I just hit the trigger because I want the more fetching option done. Yeah. It's like they, they made it as streamlined as possible, so you don't have to sit yeah, there and Yeah, you basically wait. just like pause and then hit a left yeah. trigger, right trigger, upgrade, it takes, gone. It takes five seconds, uh, and that that is very nice. Tomb Raider. Yeah. You, you apparently checked out, Ben. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I saw the demo at the uh, Xbox party. Uh, played it very, very briefly. Um, what did you think? Uh, this is with the bear, right? The bear, yeah. Um, I thought it was cool. Uh, I, I think it affirmed that uh, the new Tomb Raider is looking great. I really liked the first Tomb Raider, so I'm definitely excited for this. Yeah. Um, I, I, the more I thought about it, though, it uh, didn't really stand out amongst all of the E3 demos that I saw mm-hmm. um, when potentially you know, Uncharted did. And I think you could say Uncharted and Tomb Raider are... Or, uh, uh, at odds, if you will, you know, for, for sales in their respective genres. Well, you noticed in the PSX demo, Uncharted kind of stole some mechanics from Tomb Raider with the whole, uh, like, the porous walls that you could climb up. Oh, yeah, for sure. They'll, they'll, they'll definitely be stealing things from each other moving forward. The Tomb Raider demo to me, where it was, it was one of those presentations where what they were saying seemed really promising and didn't necessarily come through in the demo, and I don't know sure. if that was just a constraint of time, but... They said, the first thing that they said was we're bringing the tombs back to Tomb Raider. Um, and they kind of showed... Uh, going, they, they had tombs in the last game. They, they did, but so they were very optional mean? and they were very small. What they okay, tried yeah. to explain here is that it would be kind of the core of the game. And you wouldn't just be doing these little optional puzzles. That the main areas you'd be going through had a lot more to them. Uh, and they were, they were more esoteric than, than a lot of the you know, original game stuff where you just kind of go through an area cover to cover. Shoot they guys. had a lot more tomb them. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's a pun. Oh, boy. <laughs> <Wow. laughs> but who knows? Because the E3 trailer itself was not that interesting. Yeah, and the gameplay that they showed at the press conference was was okay. It was exciting. Yeah. Um, but just you know, a lot of climbing and and action moments built up around climbing. Um, yeah. But they talked a little bit more about. Um, uh, the customization of weapons. Yep. Uh, I like that the, the the bear was kind of set up as this villain that kept you know you were introduced to and kept returning throughout the what, what yeah. uh, uh, seemed like the early portion of the game, mm-hmm. um, which was kind of similar to the early portions I felt of the first Tomb Raider. So I'm excited. Uh, I think if you liked the first Tomb Raider, I think um, uh, I'm a little worried that there's just going to be a lot of snow. That like everything's going to be a snow level. Uh, haven't seen a lot of uh, a lot of the interiors uh, that I thought made the, the first game really interesting. Um, seeing a little bit of a, a, a military compound. We did see that in the earlier demo, which was kind of cool. Uh, I, I think at one point, correct me if I'm wrong, like she approached like a, a, a military complex and the hel- helicopter comes in yep. and lands there. Yep. Um, so you, you definitely get a vibe that, you know, these aren't just um, guys out in the, the, you know, with guns or, you know, knives and stuff like that out in the middle of nowhere that are defending themselves, but like a, a major presence of yeah. uh, trained soldiers. 
it's, uh, there for whatever reason. We still don't know. We still don't know what she's doing there, what she's after. It's so funny that you, you talk about you not wanting everything to be snowy. So many <laughs> big budget sequels, it's like, okay, now it's time to, to go to the snow. Like you think about uh, Modern Warfare 2's E3 demo. Mm. In a lot of ways, it's very, very similar to this, uh, what we're seeing on screen now. Just I interesting. A, I have a quick question about the game. Do they say if it's going to be kind of like open world, I guess, how the first one was? So the thing that they talk about is they're going to be hubs, okay. right? So you sort of have your main sequences where you're going through a relatively confined area, but then you get to these hubs, and that's where you gather resources to upgrade your weapons, and there will be extra challenge things that if you defeat them, you will get a reward, like a special reward that you couldn't otherwise get. And one of the examples that they sh said is, like, that bear that we're showing here, yes, you do encounter it in the story, but there will be other animals like that that will be more challenging than normal enemies that you can find in these hub areas, and if you do, A bottomless them. snowman, I'm calling it. A bottomless snowman Sweet. would be awesome. Get some Yeti action. Awesome. Yep. That'd be yeah. excellent. Um, so, yeah, so we're, we're, pro uh, we're coming down on games that I... Uh, either have not seen at all, haven't even heard of, but we have two that uh, we did talk about a little bit. I know I talked about them. Uh, yep. Abzu was one that we did just played on because I got to check it out at Judges Week. Really quickly, you got to check it out. Yeah, I got to check it out. Um, um, this was one I was really excited about at Judges Week just because it was it's, it's so relaxing. It's basically Journey Underwater. Um, yeah, but one of the things they said um, is that, uh, you know, Journey, it kind of pushes you forward just through the nature of the co-op. And that was one of the questions I had going in. Is like, well, is this going to have a similar kind of thing where you see other people out there exploring? Um, but uh, yeah, obviously it's, it's, it's focused on being a solo experience so that you can, you can get out there and you can kind of discover the world on your own. And it's, just, it's interesting because you know, they said that they, they are scuba divers and, and there's, a, there's a lot of that put. It's, it's just like a lot of care put into that. Like they're, they're basing everything on real world fish. They want to explore aspects to sharks that go beyond just like being afraid of them and, and aggression and, and things like that. Uh, and yet there's like a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of, of mystery and, and, and weirdness going on as well. So you, you find these drones and you use them to extract minerals and you're like, well, you don't know what that's about at first. Um, and, and you sort of, you know, you, you, you do it without really knowing what the, the net result's going to be. Um, but it's really cool just like, you know, how much work and focus they're putting into, you know, having this world with like all these kelp with individual leaves and thousands of fish swimming around and being able to school with the fish and ride on a manta ray and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, and it's just, yeah, it, it's interesting to, to kind of have those interactions uh, and, and not really like be like super focused on, on the research and, and that. Uh, yeah, there's some of the, the footage from the demo there and the grouper. Um, and uh, did, we, did we lose Ian? Is he, is he on a... Yeah, he's gone. He's on a run. Yeah, he said P-roll and he went on a quick break. <laughs> um, uh, I, but I, I really got to focus on how awesome the controls are in this game. You know, yeah. like how mm. you know, swimming underwater uh, for a game as awesome as The Witcher is still like... I'm still, you know, pulling my hair out every t time I try to make Geralt go above and below the waves. And they've, they've tweaked that a little bit too. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it's... And, and it's not just like, oh, I'm curious what system they're going to use for swimming. Okay, I got it now. Now I'm good at it. Like, I literally was good at swimming immediately. Like, just moved him in one direction, moved the camera in the other, and was like, oh, thank you. That's great. Uh, I think and, it might be a her, actually. It probably is a her. Um, <laughs> and, and something to be said for uh, this environment, because when you play Journey, you're grounded. You know, there's gravity. So it's like it's gluing you to the sand. And then you, you have this... You know, you start a you startup journey and you have this mountain that you're clearly going towards. So anytime you're in the desert, it's like, well, I can go over there, but I really probably should head in this direction. Whereas in the demo, they drop you right in the middle of the ocean without any real direction on where to go. And when I'm going through environments like you're seeing right now, like one of my concerns was that uh, I was constantly going to get lost, that I wasn't know like, wh like, where are you guiding me? Where am I supposed to be going? And it was just felt really organic moving through this environment, discovering new things. Before I realized it, I'd reached the end of the demo, and I was like, oh, I guess I did go where you wanted me to, but I didn't feel constrained. I didn't feel like I was, you know, like, hugging the walls of environments just trying mm -hmm. to, like, find the right way to go. Uh, that I was, you know, that there was always some, always some place I wanted to see. You know, always some opening to some cave or an opening to a clearing or yeah, some spot sand, above me or below me. Sand will me. cover up an opening sometime and use a drone so to suck the sand out. And, of you course, beautiful music. The, the game looks as good as, uh, as, as it looks right now, basically. Controls. You really can swim well. with turtles. 
Like I'm in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. grab a super cool. when you take yeah. off. It's really fun uh, and just super relaxing. And for for something as uh, a week as stressful as Judge's week, it definitely stood out because it's just like, oh, thanks. I need thank you for that <laughs> game. I needed that. Um, and for honor, we talked about a time. What else do we have to say about for well, honor? We, well, these guys got to play it, or I got to play it after we talked about it before. Yeah. It's so good. And we love awesome. it. Awesome. <laughs> we do. Oh, man. For honor, you guys. Yeah. That game. It's the real deal. It is the real deal. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm going to tell my bragging story because I have to. Do it. Because everyone in there was like cheering me on. Smug, Smug blood. Smug words. blood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but so anyways, you know, just that whole mechanic, that sword play mechanic, uh, you know, and, and having to block people from different directions. One of the, the, the choke points you get into is, you know, it, it starts to feel like, well, the way the way that you win this, the way that you beat somebody in this, is you just you get up with another teammate and you double team the guy, and that's how you take care of him. So here I was, people are double teaming me, I'm blocking them both, and then I take them both down. It just felt so satisfying to be able to take two guys down that they thought they had me and they just didn't. Literally, there's like 30 minutes left in the demo, and he just like puts the controller down. Yeah, but we were walks away. <laughs> yeah. Smug blood. Smug blood, yeah. We were back and forth, though. Like, there was, it was just like, oh, we're about to win, we're about to win. And then, nope, they're about to win, they're about to win. It was just for a long time. Yeah, that's what happened to mm-hmm. us, too. But can we, can, I mean, can we talk really quickly about the, uh, the, the, the slightly underhanded practice that we observed from uh, PR people at this E3? Oh. And that is, oh my God. And yes. that is false congratulation. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you're doing so good. I haven't seen anyone play as good this all is day. A, this is a strange conspiracy that we have uncovered at E3 2015. Yeah. And that is, oh, wait, how, how, how did, how, what was your time there on that demo? You're like, I don't know, like eight and a half minutes. Whoa. Yeah. Well, that's like the best demo we had yeah. today. Yeah. All right. That's it. Job. That's you're the like, thing oh, that gets wow. me. Yeah. When they that's said, really cool. wow, you did better than anyone I've like, ever seen. Wow. I hate that, man. I, I got was, that with I Star Fox. I, I got so that good. with the Morpheus head bashing VR thing. Right. Um, and we, uh, we, uh, we like Breaking joked about it, and all of a sudden Creed. it like kept popping up. Like a lot of people were noticing it. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it almost, I walked away from the Assassin's Creed demo feeling like they just want us to break the game because I. Like, I don't know how many guys played it, but we've talked about it a little bit, but you, you're you in a carriage chase, and you're just supposed to chase them from A to B, and I just trapped her, got up, killed the person. He's like, oh, you weren't supposed to be able to do that. <laughs> it's like, well, what, well, now what do I do? He's like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but you did really good. It's like, thanks. Your game's broken. Bye. I yeah. Was, I was playing... I was playing... Uh, what was I playing? Planet Side Two with Nick Plessis last night. Plessis effect. Plessis effect. And Plessis, you were playing. Wait, you were playing Planet Side Two with Plessis? On it came out on a PS4. The, yeah. the beta. That game is, that not is weird. But uh, <laughs> it was really funny because he was like, "Yeah, man, I I was playing the Battlefront, uh, the Star Wars Battlefront demo, and I got like." 80 kills or something. They said that it was the best they'd seen all day. And in my mind, I was like, eh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe them. So but. don't, don't. If you ever hear that at E3 or any other event where they're mm-hmm. like, oh, that was the quickest See, time. Here's, here's the problem. Don't though. believe them. Here's the problem. Here's why I, I, I hesitate with that. Because every time we try to get cam footage and we're not playing, it's awful. There's stuff that, that Matt didn't even put up. <laughs> that man shot. It was like, no. We, we, no. Oh, just of other people playing games? Yeah. Yikes. Oh, so everyone else sucks and we're you just really good at games? First. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, game wow, first. there it is. But I mean, there's like, there's a lot of people on the floor that and just don't Smug blood. Yeah. Smug blood. <laughs> smug blood. I felt bad. GT uh, smug. There were, uh, the, I was getting footage of, of a few people and I think twice I had to say to the camera guy, like, uh, let's actually move over to this person. Might be a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. We've been there. I mean, even if you're not capturing footage for your, your website or your company, you know, like, you don't want to watch somebody play a game poorly. It's no, it's, like, <laughs> it's not that we're good. It's just that everyone yeah. at E3 is really bad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. People think I mean, we're E3, terrible. E3 is I not think it's like good to leave it there. I think that's place. good to leave that conversation there. Great. <laughs> uh, Banner Saga 2, Mr. Daniel Bloodworth. Yeah. Uh, Banner Saga 2 is not a good game to show at E3. Uh, but yeah. I, I can give some quick bullet points somewhere. Very quick. Um, it's, uh, one of the, you know, it, it is picking up from the story. It does use your save file um, based on like some of the decisions you made at the nice. end of the story. And that was just on PC, right? That didn't go to any other systems? Right. Uh, well, it'll be on, uh, I think, iPad and iPhone. It is on mobile yeah. ah, already. Okay. Um, but, uh, well, two is not yet. But uh, Yeah, but one is. But And then... Uh, one of the other things they they showed is that uh, they've 
they put like actual obstacles into the battlefields now, and so you can take cover as a sniper, and that kind of influences line of sight on uh, some of the enemies. And um, and then to kind of uh, keep the story moving along a little bit better, they've they've added in like story as you're crossing the battlefield, so like little speech bubbles coming out of the characters. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, and the side of the story that they showed, it was like. Uh, what was his name? Rook, I think. He he was in like this still like this kind of this grieving state. So he's just making very rash decisions, and people are like, "You're gonna get yourself killed." What are you trying to do? And uh, so it, it's interesting, you know. It's it's you know it's a very desperate game to begin with, but it's an interesting place for it to start out. But I mean, for for a game like that, it wasn't broke. Don't fix it. You know, you really like right. First Banner Saga, so you would you would accept something where like maybe just refine the systems, add a couple new gameplay mechanics, and then just more of this awesome game yeah and i unfortunately didn't get to really talk to anybody about like what some of the new goals are but you know again not the greatest game to show at e3 sky shines bedlam there's a title yeah um i don't understand why people are stuck on this bedlam term so like now they're like putting weird things on like the company's name bedlam okay uh but it's just like three guys um i know one of them was uh from vigil i'm trying to remember what the others were from but anyways uh oh one of them was from like old school midway um but uh so they're taking the banner shock engine and they're making a roguelike kind of with it so if you think about like banner saga plus ftl and you've got like this this big like mobile home kind of crossing the desert uh with a bunch of survivors in it and uh but like you have all of these different factions it's like you can be a bunch of mutants or you can be a bunch of marauders or or, or whatever and they all have uh different um different strengths and weaknesses of course and you're just kind of, you know, kind of trying to survive your way across the, the wasteland and you get into like, you know, each different little zone and, uh, and it, again, have to deal with people. Oregon know. Trail meets Mad Max. I'm down. Yeah. But kind of, kind of that way. But, you know, there's three <laughs> yeah. guys making this thing and it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, and we'll probably be able to check more of it out soon. Looks awesome. Yeah. It looks really cool. I'm way down, but you're done. You're out of games. Everything is on Ben now. Ben, Here you, we gotta, go. you gotta Lightning wrap this up. You gotta, yeah, seriously, these four games. In whatever order you choose. Okay. Well, let's just go down the list. I'm not going to ask questions. I just want info. I just want the details. Rodeo All right, here we go. Rodeo has been, been like, talked about in Japan forever. Rodeo was fantastic. I actually yeah. uh, admittedly did not hear about the game before I started it's playing it. R-O-D-E-A. Rodea. Rodea. Yeah. Um, it's made by the guy who I don't – his name escapes me right now, but he worked on the original Sonic Hedgehog and Knights. Is that um, Yuji Naka? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Clutch. <laughs> Clutch <laughs> Bloodworth. Um, and it felt very much like – Knights. Uh, so you, you play as this character, and you can move around the environment, but you spend most of your time in the sky. Um, and basically, you can ascend vertically, and then you can home in on enemies and bounce off of them. Uh, and you have this stamina meter, and once you get good at it, and it, it doesn't control like exact quite like any other game that I've played, so it, it takes, there's a, definitely a learning curve, but once you do, and you're just in the air, comboing off enemies, soaring through rings, finding secrets tucked into the corner of the world, and these, these areas that you're exploring are huge, and they, there's things like way up in the sky, and you're like, how do I get there? And then you finally figure it out, and it's super satisfying. And it, and it has that kind of old school N64 3D platformer vibe that I you don't get very often and uh, Rodea had that and it was it was deep awesome. breath from Brad Ellison. Yeah. This is this has been now a you're game. Talking about language. Yeah, this has been a game that's been in development for a very long time and in fact it was originally scheduled to come out on the Wii. Yeah. Uh, so what they're doing is when you buy the Wii U version, you also get a Wii disc with it. Wow. That has a Wii version of the game. Hmm. Um, and I was talking to the PR lady who was wonderful by the way, uh, excellent, very knowledgeable, very informed. Uh, and she said that she preferred playing the game that way, that it, it actually worked really well with the Wii Remote. So, curious to try that out. But, yeah, it was, I can't wait to play that game. That's a game that we should absolutely review and cover. I think a lot of people are going to be super into it. So, uh, Aider. Aider. Aider, yeah, okay. So Probably newer. <laughs> this game looks uh, creepy. Is it creepy? Uh, it is creepy in the way that Dark Souls is creepy because it's very much inspired by Dark Souls. Hmm. Um, uh, so, basically... <laughs> It, it controls almost exactly like Dark Souls. You have a light attack and a heavy attack, and you can kind of sidestep out of the way. You have a stamina. So the UI almost looks like it was lifted from <laughs> Dark Souls. You have a red health bar that looks like it came out of Dark Souls. You have a green stamina bar. Uh, but there are some... Yeah, there are even bonfires that you rest at oh to get God. your health back. The enemies don't <laughs> respond, but yeah, it, they call it... 
a bonfire and all that stuff. What's super cool about uh, Ader, Ider? I keep mispronouncing it. I think Ader, but I don't know. Okay. Is that you get unique skills based on the equipment that you have. So you had an amulet that would let you parry enemy attacks. You could also equip an amulet that would give you, uh, uh, you would be able to freeze enemies. Or as you saw right there at the end, uh, you could electrify your weapons. And that's all mapped to the same button. And again, changes based on what equipment you have. Uh, so I thought that was super cool. Mother Russia bleeds. Mother Russia bleeds. This is like, <laughs> this is honestly the game I think I'm the most excited <laughs> about. So imagine an X-rated version of Streets of Rage. X-rated. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So you play as drug-addled psychopaths, uh, and there, <laughs> there are one of four characters. I played as Boris, who his idle animation is he would just hit himself in the <laughs> face with his uh, palms. It was hilarious. Um, and so you're the demo that I played. You're going to this this strip club. I'm going to call it. it but looks it, like that's what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not a normal strip club because there are fat men in SMM gear wearing pig masks. And there are, are nude people in cages, and they're not all women. There was just a guy waving his penis around in a helicopter motion. Of course. So, <laughs> you know, it's a weird game, man. Uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> the combat just feels so good. And it's very, they said explicitly, we are taking a lot of stuff exactly from Streets of Rage. And so if you have an idea of what Streets of Rage feels like, this is exactly what this game feels like. But there's, there's this brutality to it. So you can kind of charge up your attacks. And the sounds that they make are just gross in a really good way. So Boris, what he does is when an enemy is down, you can kind of, you can headbutt them and you rear your head back and you just smack them in the face and the, the sound that it makes, it's like bone meeting bone in the, the gru most gruesome way, it's wonderful. You can take a, a pistol and if you charge and grapple, you'll kick them to the ground and shoot off their face. Uh, and excellent Very yeah i don't wonderful. i don't wonderful. think it's i don't think it's for everybody um you also the way you get your health back is sometimes you'll down enemies not completely kill them and they'll convulse and you stick a syringe in them and you fill it full of this green stuff and you shoot it into your neck and that's how you gain health back you can also use wow. the syringe to go into a berserk state where your the screen just turns like blood red the music gets faster and you do more damage and effect more and we're in rush i'm assuming therefore I, Russia bleeds. I think so. I think so. But I don't know. Do they, they allow those kind of strip clubs in Russia? Absolutely. I wouldn't know. Okay. There's only okay. one way to find out, Ben. But uh, <laughs> it was another thing that made my demo so special is as I was doing these things, as I was beating people who were bloody pulp, the developers were like genuinely loving every second of it. Like we would do something cool or something especially brutal and they would kind of chuckle to themselves. And I'm like, I think you guys have the right attitude for making this game. And finally, the deadly Tower of Monsters. Yeah, so uh, this is another game that I didn't know anything about until I encountered it. Uh, this is being made by Ace Team, who made the wonderfully weird Xenoclash and Abyss Odyssey. Ooh. Yeah, okay. so it's based on 1950s sci-fi, um, and, and like the, your your screen has sort of a film grain effect. Uh, your the the context for it is a director of an old 1950s styled movie is doing like a commentary track. And so he's narrating the whole thing. So like, okay, for this scene, we were thinking about this. Uh, and that's kind of a cool premise. And you play as that guy who talks exactly like William Shatner. Um, and they picked <laughs> up his very specific cadence and all of that stuff. And you fight uh, ape people that look like men in costumes. Like you can see that they're wearing masks. Uh, you fight dinosaurs that look like they're made out of clay and move in sort of that weird stop motion way. Um, and it's, it's uh, sort of... Uh, like a top-down brawler where you just kind of run up to things and hit them with a stick or a spear um, and you solve little puzzles. But basically there's this uh, giant tower that you need to get to and ascend uh, that gets more devious as you progress through it. But just a cool little game. Like when you knock over the trees, the trees look like they're just props. They, they don't like break apart. It just kind of falls over completely. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Ace Team is really well known for just going off in completely wild and different directions um, and I think that's exactly what they're doing here. That's pretty cool. Oh, that's a lot of games. Yeah. There's so many games to talk about that we have to do just played episodes following E3 and even more than that that we have to take up an episode of GT Live to sit and talk about all that stuff and go longer than we typically do for an episode of GT Live. Ian's rubbing his eyes. How you doing Ian? I'm good. I think, we're, I think that's it. I think we're done with stuff to talk about E3. 
E3, oh, e, no. E3, it's over, man. Well, there's How still the awards. So hollow still the awards. Inside. Still the awards, yeah. There's still the awards, which are coming this weekend. Mr. Kyle Bossman, any questions in chat that are absolutely burning to be answered before we wrap things up? Uh, No. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably not a good sign. We chat, lost them. Chat stopped asking questions, basically. We cool. lost chat. We're too fast for them. Sorry? Too fast for them? No, no, no. They were just kind of talking to themselves. They talking just got too, over it. Too boring for yeah. them. Yeah, they're oh, too boring. Wow. Uh, they, were, they were feeling. Um, they were definitely feeling uh, the Russia one. Yeah. yeah, Russia. Absolutely. That was getting some enthusiasm. Uh, I'm feeling all of these. I think we had a. I think we had a darn good E3. Um, I'm definitely excited for all of this stuff. And, yes. Uh, ben, Incredible E3. And Ben, you had a busy E3 because you were just always down at the show floor and then yeah. rushing mm-hmm. back and talking to us about stuff and then right back down the show floor again. So yeah. appreciate you going to check stuff out. Huber is out this week. Otherwise, he would have joined us. Yeah. Uh, I Huber's wish. on vacation. I wish Huber he, was here for Mother Russia Bleeds. Like, that is a game a, yeah, that I Huber need game. to play with <laughs> yeah. Michael Huber. Uh, well, if we, yeah, if we get to stream that, I'm sure we'll get his take on that later. Yeah. Uh, any, any last comments before we, we pseudo wrap up our E3 coverage other than our awards? <laughs> for Mr. Bloodworth? Um, yeah, just thanks for, for watching. It's been kind of crazy getting all this stuff lined up. But, uh. And yeah, sorry for this uh, uh, unusual episode of GT Live. There was just so much more to talk about. And we well, wanted we, to be sure. I mean, are, I wanted to hear about these games, you know, like half of these games, you know. We, say, we are com- contemplating doing just plates a little bit more like this more often. Yeah, we, you know, because we had such a great reaction from you guys uh, about streaming uh, here specifically on this stage. And we're looking uh, to do more of that in the future. Um, we don't want to make like a knee jerk reaction and change up our whole, whole schedule. But uh, in July, look for changes to the, the, the game trailers uh, schedule as far as bringing stuff to you first live and then. Uh, putting that up on our YouTube channel and our website later, uh, which is basically how we handle all our E3 coverage, which sadly is coming to a close. As we mentioned before, we're going to have our E3 awards that will be going up uh, this weekend. Uh, we have eight categories, uh, including, obviously, Best Trailer, of course, uh, and Game of the Show. Uh, and we all had differing opinions, and uh, thankfully we all celebrated lots of different games, I thought, in the nominees across all of the separate videos. Uh, so look for that later this week. Thank you, Kyle, for checking out with chat. Thank you, Blair, for hanging out for the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Ian, for... Uh, sitting on the control panel and thank you everyone on this panel for talking about E3 yeah. and thank you all for watching uh, we will be back next week next Wednesday for a regular episode of GT Live we'll see you then now you can say bye now I can say bye bye, bye. bye.